Number 16. The Attempted Kidnapping of a British Princess Queen Elizabeth's only daughter, 23-year-old Princess Anne, and her husband Philip were on their way back to Buckingham Palace after a charity film screening on the night of March 20th, 1974. But before they made it back to the palace, a white Ford Escort forced their limousine to stop in the road. It happened just 200 yards from their destination, but it was far enough away for the driver of the Ford to confront the royal party with two handguns without being noticed by palace security. Riding in the limousine with the couple was 31-year-old Inspector James Wallace Beaton. He got out of the car to confront the Ford driver, who was later described by Smithsonian Magazine as a bearded man with light red hair named Ian Ball. Inspector Beaton assumed the man was a disgruntled driver, but he never got a chance to find out before a bullet struck him in the shoulder. Beaton was the only member of SO14, the Scotland Yard branch tasked with protecting royalty, and he'd been assigned to act as Princess Anne's security that night. He was armed and tried to shoot Ball, but his gun jammed after firing once. 26-year-old Ball had meticulously planned to kidnap Anne, renting a car under a fake name and bringing along with him two pairs of handcuffs. He also packed Valium tranquilizers and wrote a ransom letter addressed to the Queen, demanding two million pounds ransom to be delivered in five pounds sterling notes. After shooting Beaton, Ball pulled repeatedly on the limousine door handle while Anne and Philip fought to keep the door shut. Meanwhile, Anne's lady-in-waiting crawled out of the car on the opposite side. Beaton then jumped back in and inserted himself between the couple and the aggressor as Ball shot into the car. As Beaton fell out of the vehicle and onto the ground from multiple gunshot wounds, chauffeur Alexander Callender confronted Ball. The gunman shot him in the chest, then opened the car door and grabbed Anne's wrist while Philip held onto her waist. As the men fought over Anne, she told Ball she didn't want to go with him, taking a more irritated than scared tone. But Ball refused to back down. He shot responding police constable Michael Hills, who radioed for backup as he collapsed to the ground. Several civilians intervened, including a six-foot-four cleaning executive and former boxer named Ronald Russell, who approached the scene on foot. And a driver named Glenmore Martin also tried to stop the kidnapping attempt by blocking Ball's car with his vehicle in order to prevent Ball from fleeing the scene. Daily Mail journalist John Brian McConnell also confronted Ball and was shot. Russell, the former boxer, struck Ball in the back of the head. A struggle ensued as Ball attempted to keep his control over Anne, but Russell repeatedly punched him. Finally, as numerous police officers looked on, Ball fled the scene on foot. He was quickly captured and eventually pleaded guilty to kidnapping and attempted murder. And for his senseless actions, the court sentenced him to life in a mental asylum. Number 15. Homeowner fights back against felonious foursome. Early one morning in May of 2022, a homeowner in Auburn, Indiana, awoke to his dog barking and encountered four intruders who were attempting to carry out a burglary. One of the suspects pointed a gun at the victim, while two others stole various items. They also ordered the homeowner to write them a check. But as soon as the opportunity presented itself, the homeowner grabbed his shotgun and fatally shot two of the suspects, who were later identified as 36-year-old Rameka LaSharon Moore and 22-year-old Dylan Scott Moorefield. He forced the third robber outside at gunpoint, where he found a fourth suspect waiting in a getaway car, whom he ordered to call 911. The getaway driver complied, and emergency responders were dispatched to the scene. The surviving suspects, 42-year-old Tabitha L. Johnson and 42-year-old Sean T. Cruz of Fort Wayne, were taken into custody on suspicion of felony burglary and murder. Although neither of them fired the shots that killed their co-conspirators, Indiana law allowed for them to be held responsible for their accomplices' deaths. While researching the suspect's backgrounds, local station WANE15 discovered that all four of the alleged burglars had criminal histories. Records showed that Tabitha Johnson had multiple prior misdemeanor convictions, with the most recent being for one count of possession of a narcotic resulting from a plea deal she took in 2021. Her crime stretched as far back as 2000, when she was convicted of non-support of a dependent child. Sean Cruz had at least three felonies under his belt, 
including a 2014 forgery conviction, as well as theft convictions from 2009 and 2012. Authorities deemed the shooting justified under Indiana's Stand Your Ground law and declined to press criminal charges against the homeowner. During the investigation, detectives learned that Johnson had stayed with the homeowner on and off for roughly a decade. It's believed that she told her co-conspirators about possible valuables that might be in the home, and as it turned out, the four suspects had gone to the residence the day before the intrusion and had pressured the homeowner to give them money. But when their request for cash was denied, they returned early the next morning and took a more forceful approach. Johnson pleaded guilty to one count of burglary in exchange for having the murder charge dropped. She received a 14-year prison sentence for her role in the botched robbery. Cruz also took a plea deal and admitted to one count of assisting in burglary, and in exchange for his cooperation, the other charges were dropped. The prosecution recommended a four-year sentence with only two to be served in prison, and they also urged the judge to require Cruz to undergo drug rehab. Cruz is scheduled to be sentenced on June 12, 2013. Number 14. Tennessee Homeowner Defends Teenage Son a Murfreesboro, Tennessee homeowner was at his house with his teenage son and his dog when two masked intruders broke in at around 8.30 p.m. one day in May 2023. The burglars used a taser on the dog and held the teenager at gunpoint, but luckily the homeowner had enough time to retrieve his gun. He fired his weapon in self-defense and fatally shot 52-year-old Kevin Ford, who was pronounced dead at the scene by emergency responders. The second suspect, later identified as 42-year-old Clifford Wright, fled the scene and was later found at a local Salvation Army shelter, suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. But he was taken to a hospital for treatment and survived his injuries. Wright faces charges of aggravated burglary, attempted aggravated robbery, being a convicted felon in possession of a firearm and possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent felony. Speaking anonymously with local station WTVF, the homeowner said he heard his dog barking as if he was in pain. But once he realized what was going on, he said that he knew it was either them or me and my family, and he wasn't about to let it be the latter. He also said that he wished the situation hadn't played out the way it did, but that he was glad the outcome was in his favor. Under Tennessee law, a homeowner can shoot an intruder when they believe that the use of force is necessary to prevent or terminate the other's trespass on the land or unlawful interference with the property. Consequently, authorities declined to charge the man who shot the intruders in defense of his property, himself, and his loved ones. Wright remained behind bars at the Rutherford County Adult Detention Center on $700,000 bail while he awaits his next court date. Number 13. Club Goer Stops Mass Shooter In a horrifying scenario that's becoming all too common in the United States, an armed shooter entered a gay nightclub in Colorado Springs on the night of November 19, 2022. The suspect then opened fire on a dance party with an AR-15 assault rifle. Wearing body armor and carrying multiple magazines filled with ammunition, the shooter, later identified as 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich, began indiscriminately spraying bullets at both customers and employees at Club Q. Many patrons initially mistook the gunfire for music, but they quickly realized what was happening when the sound of the shots continued and they saw muzzle flashes. Hoping to escape the gunfire, people rushed behind the bar and into dressing rooms for cover, while others stayed low to the ground. Several minutes into the shooting, a U.S. Army veteran named Richard M. Fierro charged across the room and took Aldrich to the ground, causing him to drop his gun on his way to the floor. Fierro then grabbed a rifle and repeatedly struck Aldrich in the head with it. Holding Aldrich down, however, was no easy task. At an estimated 300 pounds, the shooter wasn't a small guy. But Fierro managed to keep him subdued with the help of fellow patron Thomas James, who took the gun and kept it out of Aldrich's reach, and a trans woman who stomped on the suspect with her heels while they waited for police to arrive. Five people died in the gunfire, while 19 others were injured, but authorities believe that number would have been much higher if it weren't for Fierro and the two other civilian bystanders who bravely intervened. Aldrich remains in custody while facing 305 criminal counts, including five counts of murder and five counts of committing a bias-motivated crime, 
causing bodily injury. He reportedly has a criminal record, as well as a troubling history of facilitating hate speech on a website he created. But the judge overseeing his current case has ordered for his record to be sealed due to the potential for his past to affect the ongoing case. Number 12. Good Samaritans Thwart Kidnapping in Progress On what began as a typical Friday morning on June 2, 2023, a man allegedly showed up at the Plymouth, Massachusetts home of his estranged wife, despite the victim having an order of protection in place against him. He's accused of abducting the woman by grabbing her head and neck and pulling her as she clung to one of her children. The victim's screaming got the attention of neighbor and former corrections officer Jamie Costa, who tackled the suspect, and as the kidnapper reached for what appeared to be a gun in his waistband, two brothers who were working nearby, Jeffrey Williams and David Williams, rushed over to the scene. One of the brothers helped Costa tackle the alleged kidnapper, while the other brother pulled his own gun on the suspect. The trio then held the suspect down until Officer Bobby Hackett arrived on scene in response to a call about a man with a gun chasing a woman. Costa later told NBC Boston that he stopped at his home to grab some things when he overheard an altercation taking place across the street. He said that he knew it was serious when he saw the victim struggling against her captor as he dragged her uphill. Without thinking twice, he sprang into action. Until the Williams brothers arrived, Costa fought to keep the suspect from accessing the gun that he appeared to be reaching for. The Williams brother, who pulled his own gun on the abductor, apparently issued a verbal warning that he was armed and that things were going to get ugly if the man continued to fight. Authorities charged the 39-year-old suspect with violation of a restraining order, assault and battery on a family member, kidnapping, assault with a dangerous weapon, and reckless endangerment of a child. Responding officers also found a face mask and handcuffs in his possession. Plymouth police credited Costa and the Williams brothers with saving the victim's life. Speaking with NBC Boston, Costa said he intervened without hesitation and that he hopes others do the same if they ever see a situation like that going on. And it wasn't the first time he was commended for his bravery. Back in 2019, Costa received a reward for tackling a man as he fled from police. Number 11. Pregnant wife saves the day. A Florida woman named Casey Johns sprang into action despite being eight months pregnant when she found her husband, Jeremy King, being beaten, kicked, and pistol whipped by two armed intruders in 2019. It was at the couple's home in Lithia, roughly 25 miles from Tampa, at around 9 p.m. when the suspects barged in and demanded money at gunpoint. Each intruder was armed with a handgun and one of them fired a shot while inside the home. But when she saw what was happening, Johns grabbed the family's AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and fired a single shot, striking one of the suspects. And according to police, the gun was legally owned. The suspects fled on foot but the one who got shot didn't make it very far before he collapsed in a drainage ditch and died. Authorities identified the deceased intruder as 27-year-old Joseph Michael Byers. Meanwhile, King was taken to the hospital with multiple injuries, including a fractured eye socket, a fractured sinus cavity, and a concussion. He received 20 stitches and three staples to the head, but it could have been much worse. In fact, King told Bay News 9 that if it wasn't for his wife stepping in, he might have been killed. Following an investigation, authorities charged Baez's alleged accomplice, 19-year-old Tyzee Robinson, with felony murder. And although King's wife fired the fatal shot, investigators determined that the shooting was justified from the homeowner's standpoint and that Robinson could be held accountable for his co-conspirator's death. They also charged the suspected getaway driver, 24-year-old Kiara Rajans, with accessory to felony murder. King said that neither he nor his wife knew their attackers, but it appeared as though the suspect specifically targeted the family, according to Major Frank Lossett from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, who spoke with reporters on the scene. Moreover, law enforcement believed that the Kings were targeted because of criminal activity that was allegedly going on in the home at the time of the crime. 
Consequently, Child Protective Services concluded that the couple's children were in an unsafe environment and removed them from the home, leaving Jeremy King both appalled and dumbfounded, as he put it. Speaking with Bay 9 News, King adamantly denied any ongoing criminal activity at his home, despite having a marijuana possession conviction on his record. And as if the case wasn't already complicated enough, in early 2020, authorities charged yet another suspect for their alleged involvement in the crime. 19-year-old Dalton Martin was at the King's home when the attempted robbery occurred, and the victims reportedly found it suspicious that he didn't take action to try stopping the crime in progress. According to investigators, this was because Martin knew about the home invasion ahead of time and was in on it. For his role in the crime, he was charged with second-degree felony murder with a firearm. Martin narrowly avoided prison time and was sentenced to 15 years of probation, while Tyze Robinson was acquitted by a jury. The outcome of the case for the third surviving suspect, Kiara Rajins, is unclear, and it's unknown whether King got his children back. Number 10. Alicia Dickin There are few issues that Americans are more divided on than guns, especially as the United States remains plagued by record shootings in recent years. But it was hard to deny that it was a good thing 22-year-old Alicia Dickin had his gun on him when a mass shooter opened fire at a shopping mall in Indiana in 2022. The incident in question began in a food court at Greenwood Park Mall shortly before 6 p.m. on Sunday, July 17th. Dickon was shopping with his girlfriend at the time, and the mall was getting ready to close when gunshots echoed through the building. Less than two minutes after the shooting began, Dickon pulled his handgun and opened fire on the suspect, who tried fleeing into a nearby bathroom, but was fatally struck by the gunfire. Three civilians lost their lives in the mass shooting, and four others were injured, but authorities believed those numbers would have been much higher if Dickon hadn't intervened. Investigators identified the shooter as a 20-year-old local resident with no criminal history named Jonathan Douglas Sapperman. He entered the mall with three guns and over a hundred rounds of ammunition in his possession that day. But thanks to Dickens' response to the gunfire, he only managed to shoot 24 rounds before he was stopped. Sapperman was responsible for all three civilian deaths that occurred. Over a five-year period starting in 2017, the suspect had made over 200 Reddit posts referencing mass shootings. And while none of his commentary suggested that he was actually planning on committing one, he seemed oddly fascinated with gun crimes and had a troubling fixation with Nazi Germany. In the months leading up to the shooting, Sapperman had quit his warehouse job and was facing eviction from his apartment. During a press conference the day after the shooting, Greenwood Police Chief Jim Eisen described Dickens' actions as nothing short of heroic, as well as proficient and tactically sound. He further explained how the quick-thinking civilian engaged the shooter from quite a distance as he moved in on the suspect while motioning for people to exit behind him. Authorities determined that Dickon was carrying his gun lawfully and that his decision to respond to the gunfire by shooting at Sapperman was justified. Dickon had no police or military training, but had been taught to shoot by his grandfather. Number 9. Relative Rescues Kidnapping Victim 29-year-old Bethany Arsenault experienced the terror of a lifetime when she was kidnapped by her ex-boyfriend and the father of her child, Scott Thomas, in Louisiana in 2013. Bethany had an order of protection against Thomas, which he'd violated at least once before he abducted her. But because they had a son together, they couldn't completely avoid interacting with one another. The kidnapping happened when Bethany went to pick up her son from Thomas after finishing her workday. According to a police interview, Thomas tried to hug Bethany while she stood outside his car. She rejected the affectionate advances and got into her car to leave, at which point Thomas reached into her vehicle and tried unbuckling their child from his car seat. Bethany sped away, only to have Thomas chase after her in his vehicle. The brief pursuit ended outside a daycare center, where witnesses saw the young woman running with her son in her arms and yelling at bystanders to dial 911. Horrified onlookers watched as Thomas shoved Bethany and the child into his vehicle and drove off with one hand on the steering wheel and another holding his ex-girlfriend by her hair. Bethany would later claim that she nearly escaped at least once, but nobody came to help when she screamed. 
Three days of sheer terror followed as Thomas held her at knife point and repeatedly threatened to kill her while taking her to various hiding places. He abandoned his car in a rural area and forced Bethany to walk through the forest and a sugarcane field, making multiple stops before ending up at an abandoned house. And by then, Bethany was barefoot and her clothes were ripped. Left with no other choice, Bethany slept on a dirty mattress at knife point for the next several nights using an old piece of carpet as a blanket. Thomas allowed her to call her sister before he took his phone apart, and the victim later described how her ex occasionally paced by the windows of the house while saying things like, you should have just loved me, and why didn't you love me? At various points throughout the harrowing ordeal, Bethany could hear law enforcement searching for her, but she was too afraid that her ex would kill her to try reaching help. Thomas repeatedly threatened to kill Bethany if the cops figured out where they were and descended upon the scene. And during one moment of desperation, Bethany tried to hit Thomas with a rod she found in the bathroom, but it was ineffective and only made him angrier. She also tried to escape through the bathroom window, but Thomas caught her and no longer allowed her to use the bathroom unsupervised. By the third morning, Thomas knew help was getting close and he seemed more paranoid and nervous than ever. He then told Bethany that it was almost time for them to die. By the time Bethany's cousin Marcus Arsenault kicked down the door with over a dozen family members in tow, Thomas was cutting and stabbing her. Marcus wasted no time following the sound of Bethany's screams to a small bedroom where he shot Thomas 11 times. Thankfully, Bethany survived her injuries and authorities declined to prosecute Marcus Arsenault or any of the woman's other relatives for their role in Thomas's death. Some people claimed that the Arsenault family took action and barged into the abandoned house because the police refused to do so, although it's unclear if this is true. Number 8. Florida Homeowner Fires at Burglars A Florida man and his girlfriend were just coming inside at around 2 a.m. after a night out in 2023 when they encountered two strangers in the kitchen of their Haines City home. The homeowner drew his 9mm handgun, which he had a permit to carry, and fired five rounds at the suspect closest to him. He then fled the home with his girlfriend and their puppy and dialed 911 while driving to the police station. The couple met with law enforcement and were cooperative with the investigation right from the beginning. During a press conference, Haines City Police Chief Greg Gorick said that the homeowner immediately surrendered his gun and showed his concealed carry permit. And after hearing the victim's version of events, police decided that the shooting most likely qualified as a stand your ground case under Florida law. In other words, it appeared to be a justified case of self-defense. By the time responding officers arrived at the scene of the shooting, both suspects had fled, leaving behind five shell casings and a trail of blood leading outside. With help from a K-9 unit, police found one of the suspects, 27-year-old Tyreek Washington, under a pavilion at a nearby park, where he was suffering from four gunshot wounds, two to the chest and two to the legs. But even though he was suspected of committing a serious felony, the cops weren't about to let him die. The four officers who were at the scene immediately took life-saving measures by applying a tourniquet and putting pressure on the wounds to stop the bleeding. And thanks to their diligent efforts, the man survived. He was then airlifted to the hospital, where he remained in critical but stable condition in the days following the shooting. Near the pavilion where the suspect was rescued, police found a ring belonging to the homeowner. Tyreek Washington faces charges of unarmed burglary of an occupied dwelling and grand theft. And according to the most recent available updates on the case, the second suspect was still at large. Tina Phillip, who identified herself as the homeowner's aunt, told ABC Action News that her nephew was shaken up by the ordeal. In fact, she described him as being a nervous wreck. But she was relieved that he was okay, considering how much worse the situation could have turned out. Number 7. Missouri Woman Escapes Suspected Serial Killer A 22-year-old African-American woman from Missouri endured weeks of torture at the hands of a kidnapper in 2022, after multiple community members had complained to the police about her suspected serial abductor. Multiple black women had reportedly gone missing from the area, so it made sense to think that they may have all been targeted by the same person. 
yet local authorities allegedly wrote civilian concerns off as completely unfounded. The final victim and the only one to actually survive their captivity escaped from 39-year-old Timothy M. Hazlitt after being held in his basement and repeatedly assaulted over a month-long period. She saw her opportunity to break free after Hazlitt left to take his child to school one day. The woman sought help from a neighbor who called the police. Rose Crowley was babysitting her grandchild that morning when the woman showed up on the front porch. During an interview with local station KCTV, she recalled how the victim was shaking from head to toe as she pleaded for help. Crowley said that the woman was terrified that her captor was going to show up, and she remembers seeing duct tape and ligature marks on her neck and wrists. As they waited for police to arrive, Crowley brought the woman inside, put a blanket around her, and gave her some muffins and water. Responding officers arrived to find that the victim was also wearing a collar with a padlock, which they had to cut off, and latex lingerie, which Hazlitt allegedly forced the woman to wear. Crowley focused on comforting the woman while she told police about the prolonged horror she'd endured. Authorities launched a large-scale investigation into Hazlitt's past, which showed that he was a former railroad worker with no known criminal history besides several previous traffic infractions. In early 2023, he was indicted on a laundry list of charges, including two counts of second-degree assault, four counts of sodomy, one count of kidnapping, and one count of endangering the welfare of a child. According to the most recent updates on the case, Hazlitt is being held on $3 million bond as his case continues to work its way through the court system. And although it remains unclear whether there are other victims, the investigation is ongoing. And while the brave woman who managed to escape didn't stop Hazlitt in a conventional sense, it's thanks to her quick thinking that the suspect is no longer able to harm innocent civilians. Number 6. Ansley Pacheco only fan star and Instagram model Ansley Pacheco was at her home in Hialeah, Florida with her son, her husband Daniel, and some friends one evening in 2020, when a pair of masked intruders barged in with Uzis and opened fire. The armed suspects got into the apartment by following a guest as he was arriving and pushing their way in as he entered. Harrowing surveillance footage captured the men shooting at Daniel and his friends while Ansley hurried to grab her own handgun. Dressed only in her underwear, she shot back at the burglars from her bedroom while yelling at them not to shoot because her son was in the room with her. The robbers blatantly ignored Ansley's warning, though, and fired at least six bullets in her direction. She and her son narrowly avoided the gunfire, which struck several pieces of furniture and the TV. Daniel chased the men out of the home, and thankfully nobody was hurt, but the thieves made off with over $100,000 worth of jewelry. Unfortunately, it appears as though the suspects were never caught. It's unclear whether Ansley's internet fame had anything to do with why the thieves targeted her, and both she and Daniel said they had no idea who might have been responsible for the burglary. Number 5. Tina Ring and Ashley Lee while working at their family-owned liquor store in Tulsa, Oklahoma one Saturday in 2018, mother-daughter duo Tina Ring and Ashley Lee came face-to-face -face with an armed robber with a sawed-off shotgun. Later identified as 36-year-old Tyrone Lee, he held the women at gunpoint and ordered them to hand over the cash from the register. The pair complied, and as Tyrone walked away, they tried to activate the store's security system, which would have trapped the thief between two sets of front doors. But the interior door didn't lock fast enough, and the suspect was able to get back inside, leaving him and the victims trapped inside the store together. Lee allegedly pointed a gun at Tina and Ashley, who were hiding, but he was unaware that one of the women had her own handgun, and at that point she felt like she was in enough danger to justify pulling the trigger. The intruder tried escaping multiple times before finally succeeding. Luckily, though, authorities tracked Lee down after he showed up at a local hospital in critical condition from his bullet wounds. Once he was well enough to be placed behind bars, he was taken into custody on suspicion that he committed as many as nine burglaries in the week leading up to the botched liquor store robbery. During an interview with local station KFOR, Tyrone Lee apologized for his actions. But it wasn't enough to spare him from the legal consequences of his crimes. And in the end, he was sentenced to 22 years in federal prison, followed by five years of supervised release. 
Number four, Trio robs the wrong house. In a shocking encounter that was captured on camera, three armed men could be seen kicking in the front door of a Gwinnett County, Georgia home at 4 a.m. one day in 2016. But they didn't get very far before a woman burst out of the bathroom with a gun in her hands and immediately opened fire in that direction. One man died in the driveway from gunshot wounds, and at least one of the two who fled are thought to have been struck as well. In the security video, the woman's roommate could be seen consoling her and taking the gun from her hands as she stood at the scene trying to process what had just happened. She was staying at the house for work and didn't live there permanently, according to investigators, who deemed the shooting a justified case of self-defense and declined to press criminal charges. However, authorities did decide to hold one of the suspects, Bernard Little, responsible for the fatal outcome of the home invasion. 18 months after the botched burglary, he was charged with a slew of crimes, including felony murder, armed robbery, being a convicted felon in possession of a firearm, and aggravated assault. He was convicted of the charges and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. According to records, he'll see freedom again by the year 2043. Bernard Little already had multiple serious felony convictions on his record before the deadly intrusion. In 1997 alone, he was convicted of kidnapping, two counts of possession of a firearm during a crime, three counts of carjacking, armed robbery, aggravated assault, and more. And by the time he got caught for his most recent offenses, he'd already served 15 years for previous crimes. Number 3. Shea Lindbergh Shay Lindbergh was preparing to leave her office in downtown Des Moines in early 2023 when she noticed two homeless people, later identified as 56-year-old Laurie Potter and 43-year-old Michael Ross, pacing back and forth near her door. She became slightly concerned when she noticed one of the suspects allegedly waving at her young son in an apparent attempt to try getting him to go with them. But Lindbergh wrote off her concerns and concluded that the pair were likely just there to apply for a job. Instead of remaining safely inside her office, however, she decided to leave. After walking out the door, Lindbergh was approached by Potter, who she later accused of grabbing her son and claiming that she was the boy's real mother. Potter allegedly yelled at Lindbergh to give her child back and began running away with the woman's son in her arms. According to a police report, Lindbergh pulled a gun and ordered the two suspects to leave the building immediately. Luckily, the pair obeyed her command and she successfully thwarted the attempted kidnapping of her little boy. In the words of Des Moines Police spokesperson Sergeant Paul Parizak, Lindbergh's decision to brandish a weapon had the desired effect, and luckily, no actual violence was necessary. Police eventually caught up with Potter and Ross nearby and took them into custody on one count each of felony child stealing. This case is recent though, so they have yet to receive their sentences. Number 2. Joe Howard Teague Frustrated with repeated home break-ins, a 93-year-old retired plumber named Joe Howard Teague decided to turn the tables on a group of intruders who kicked in his front door one day in early 2022. Armed with a pistol, he confronted the thieves in his Moreno Valley, California home and attempted to put them under citizen's arrest. But they refused to comply with Teague's orders and began throwing things at him. So he called 911 and told the dispatcher that he was holding several suspects amid a burglary in progress at his home. Riverside County deputies arrived to find at least one suspect suffering from a gunshot wound. The others, which included at least one female suspect, had fled the scene on foot, according to witnesses. Emergency responders rushed the wounded suspect, 33-year-old Joseph A. Ortega, to the hospital in critical condition, while law enforcement took Teague to the station for questioning. After hearing the senior citizen's version of events, detectives decided that the shooting appeared to be justified. Ortega died from his injuries a week after the botched robbery, and in a statement, the sheriff's department reiterated that it had no plans to charge Teague in connection with the shooting. Number 1. Sean Patrick Suniga Three Texas residents were at their northeast El Paso home one morning in early 2023 when an intruder broke in at around 9 a.m. and fired a gun, injuring a dog at the residence. 37-year-old Sean Patrick Suniga, who lives at the house, responded by pulling his own handgun and returning fire, striking the intruder. He and the other two residents, 60-year-old Danny Russell Dennington and 32-year-old Danny Marshall Dennington, gave responding officers a description of the intruder who fled on foot. 
The suspect, 29-year-old Bruce Wayne Murphy, was found at a nearby intersection yelling for help and saying he'd been shot. He was taken to a local hospital for treatment with plans to transport him to the El Paso County Jail on suspicion of burglary of habitation once he was well enough. According to current records, there's nobody by Murphy's name currently being held, suggesting that he's still in the hospital. Either that or he was taken to jail and posted the $500,000 bond the judge set. Would you rather be accused of taking overly forceful action to stop a dangerous criminal or of failing to take adequate enough action to stop a violent situation when you had the chance? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.